thanks everyone who's able to be here in person or online to the Stem Cell Center Community Lecture Series. Um, I'm gonna foreshadow a little bit, looking ahead towards next year, we're in discussions right now to really go back to having these all in person and not virtual. It's hard to have the split audience, but thanks to everyone for attending. Um, it's also hard, despite our technological advantages to uh, advances, to switch back and forth between computers. We're gonna do a little bit of a different introduction um, uh, this evening in order to get to know Drs. Thompson and Drs. Morinkova a little bit. So with that, just quickly, I'm Eileen Anderson. I'm the director of the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center. So again, welcome. We have um, 63 or so faculty members from across campus, um, five schools, over 20 departments here. And we're really pleased to be able to host um, this series of lectures where we talk about the research that people here are doing either at the basic science or the translational science level. What we really like to do is try and focus on um, areas that are advancing quickly in, in uh, that basic to translational realm and host, when we can, a basic scientist along with a clinician who's working in this domain. And this really builds off of both our basic science and the translational efforts we have here, both um, because of our regular clinical research program, programs, but in particular because of the CIRM-funded Alpha Stem Cell Clinic. And um, that's a novel place that really is meant to specialize in cell and gene therapies, the kind of which Dr. Thompson is developing. So with that, I'd like to ask Drs. Thompson and Morinkova to come up to the front. I already warned them I'm going to put them on the spot tonight. Um, and rather than talk so much about the center, because I know that um, both of them, Leslie in particular, have really interesting stories about how they began to work in this domain. And so we're going to try and tease that out of them a little bit. So Leslie, thank you for being here as always. Thank you so much, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and why? so who are you? <laughs> at okay. UCI, um, and, uh, let, and then we'll pause for yes. a second. Okay. Uh, so I'm a Bren professor here in the departments of psychiatry and human behavior and neurobiology and behavior. So I span the School of Medicine and School of Biosci, which is a really nice perspective to have, actually, and a member of the Stem Cell Clinic, Stem Cell Center. Thank heavens. Thank heavens. <laughs> Where that was way undersold. So Leslie does so much here on campus as really a linchpin of uh, training efforts that we run through the Stem Cell Center. Um, she's a really critical part of training for um, graduate students focused in neurodegenerative diseases and, and stem cells and neurobiology. Um, and also as a part of the Precision Health Institute yeah. and, and director there, which is a huge launch for, yes. for UCI going yes. forward. And Dr. Morinkova, thank you very much for coming tonight. Pleasure to be here. Thank yes. You. Uh, I'm a clinician. 90% uh, of what I do is uh, clinical work. I see people with neurologic diseases, primarily Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, and of course, Huntington's disease. And I spend some time in clinical trials, uh, uh, also in these uh, fields of neurology. And I do some teaching here at UCI with uh, medical students and neurology residents and neurology fellows and pain fellows. So that's mostly clinical work that I do. We're very lucky to have her here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. There were some big shoes to fill yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Leslie, then, um, you're a PhD as opposed yes. to an MD on the clinic, but you work in this very translational space, right, where you're trying to take things from your laboratory and move them through to Dr. Morinkova's side of the equation. Yeah. Why do you do that, and how did you get started? <laughs> okay, so I've worked now on Huntington's disease for over 30 years. I think it's now 33 years, which kind of is dating, Don't do the dating me. Don't do the yeah. math. But no, I, in reality, I... I when I was a graduate student, I took this amazing class in human genetics, and it's the first time I ever heard of Huntington's disease. And it was right when the gene was mapped to a particular chromosome, part of place on a chromosome. And so I just started getting interested in it and then decided to do my postdoctoral fellow here, fellowship here at UCI on Huntington's disease and then started meeting families and the most amazing community in the Huntington's disease world and met Nancy Wexler, who's a force of nature, who runs an organization called the Hereditary Disease Foundation, whose mother had passed away from Huntington's disease. And just all these very dedicated researchers who would come together at workshops, 
share everything, talk about this disease. The first thing we'd do when we'd start the um, workshop is they'd have a Huntington's disease patient there who would be interviewed by a neurologist. And it was always so incredibly moving and profound that you're like, yes, please, here, take everything. Let's just work together and get this solved. So I've been working on it ever since. It's, and got to go to Venezuela. I had gone to high school in Mexico, so I spoke Spanish. And so I got to go to Venezuela and work with the families that are down there, which also was hugely motivating. But it's really been the interaction between the lab and the families and the research and just really trying to make a difference in this disease. So. Yeah. So that, um, it's such a great story, I think, because it's something that is an experience we try and give in some of your training programs, right? Mm -hmm. our, our graduate students here. It's certainly one that I had. It's partly how I ended up doing spinal cord injury research. Once you start interacting with organizations and groups that are really embedded in that, that sphere as families, it is hard to resist that siren's call. And, and so um, it really personalizes your work oh. in a way that is, yeah, yeah, completely. And we all have, we all, all the, we have a lot of people from the lab here and I think all of us are, yeah, just very committed to seeing yeah. something help Huntington's. So for people in patient organizations out there, for students, for you know, just members of the community, that kind of advocacy work that you do actually really does affect us in the labs. It's something important to know. So um, you know, even if it's attending lectures like this and giving that perspective, offering that experience, I think it's something that's really, really important. Dr. Morinkova, how did you become interested in movement disorders? I was fortunate to be associated with talented uh, uh, movement disorders, neurologists, my teachers, uh, back in Moscow, Russia. So I, I was interested, became interested in movement disorders uh, during my neurology residency training, not in medical school. I was still uh, not uh, trying to go to calculations, but I was still in medical school when the gene was discovered. <laughs> but, <laughs> Again, don't but, do the math. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, close to graduation. <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, the movement disorders field in general is an amazing field. Uh, the variety of cases that we encounter probably is a broader variety than any field in, of neurology uh, uh, one can encounter. Uh, I should say that movement disorders are probably the most treatable disorders uh, out of all Neurological disorders, epileptologists probably would argue with me, they, they can make people seizure free. But, and yes, Huntington's disease is not one of these disorders where we can say it's treatable, we can successfully address symptoms sometimes, but unfortunately we cannot meaningfully change the disease course. Uh, but of course yet. I encountered yet. Uh, but uh, of course uh, I encountered many Huntington's disease families and patients uh, in my uh, clinical career. What brought me actually to this field uh, was uh, my mentor and uh, uh, founder of this movement disorders program and this Huntington's disease clinic, Dr. Neil Hermanovitz. So that's uh, thanks to him, I, I am part of this family of researchers and patients and uh, collaborators. Okay, so that was really wonderful, both of you. Thank you so much. I had my best Peter Donovan hat on. I hope he'll be proud of me. Um, and so with that, I'd like to invite you to begin your presentation. Just a, a quick word from an organizational point of view, because of the hybrid format um, still, rather than doing questions in between or taking questions, we'll hear our first our speakers first, and then please hold all of your questions to the end. If you're watching online, um, you can put your question online. We'll answer it if we can, or we'll get to it um, by the end. So thanks again. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, again. Uh, uh, those who are here and uh, those who are joining us online, I wish I could see everyone who, who is online too. Um, uh, uh, this talk will be uh, just a basic uh, clinical introduction into the field of Huntington's disease. I will share some uh, basic uh, uh, knowledge uh, that we have at this point about Huntington's disease and some of the videos uh, of the patients and what the challenges are in this field. 
What is Huntington's disease? Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder. Inherited disorder, what does it mean? It means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease and symptoms. If you don't have the gene, you haven't inherited the gene, you will not have the disease. And the, the gene uh, operates such that uh, it disrupts multiple processes in the brain and probably outside the brain, uh, leading to what we call neurodegeneration. Uh, loss of brain cells and connections with brain cells and, and uh, loss of normal way brain cells talk to each other. Uh, and that will result in progressive uh, neurologic decline and uh, just general decline. And unfortunately, this condition is invariably fatal. Uh, we do not have any means so far to slow down its course or modify it in any way. Uh, Here's the famous uh, slide and picture of uh, uh, the brain of a normal person and person affected by Huntington's disease. You see on the left-hand side, there's a normal brain, and on the right-hand side, you see a brain affected by Huntington's disease. Uh, this, uh, this large cavities that you see, I don't have a pointer, I don't know how to... Can you see my mouse here? Yeah, yeah so this, this, these, are, these are normal cavities filled with fluid. And these are cavities that are expanded and filled with fluid. And they're expanded because of the loss of surrounding brain tissue. Uh, you see these uh, areas here in this brain. This is a coded nucleus. This is the nucleus that are preferentially uh, affected in many or majority of people with uh, Huntington's disease. But uh, entire brain gets affected. You see the striking difference between this uh, abnormal brain of Huntington's disease uh, with loss of uh, cortex and subcortical structures and this uh, other uh, gray matter structures in the brain compared to this uh, normal brain. Uh, who, who gets uh, uh, Huntington's disease? Uh, uh, both sexes get Huntington's disease. There is no predominance of men or women in the Huntington's disease, and um, all races and ethnicities are affected. Uh, the estimate is that about 40,000 Americans have Huntington's disease, and much larger number are at risk of having the disease, meaning that they may be carrying a gene and may be uh, experiencing uh, some symptoms, or maybe they're going to experience some symptoms in the future. Uh, these are some uh, videos of uh, patients. You see that these are men and women and uh, people of different ethnicities. They all uh, have one thing in common. Uh, they have inherited abnormal gene of Huntington's disease and they developed a variety of symptoms. I'll talk uh, about them a little later. But uh, these involuntary movements and the squirmy uh, twisting movements that you can observe, these are uh, one of the cardinal hallmark features of Huntington's disease. Uh, the first description, an official documented uh, uh, publication about Huntington's disease goes uh, back to 1872 when uh, George Huntington uh, graduated of medical school. I think he, he just graduated it, uh, from medical school one year before he uh, published this uh, uh, article about Korea where he gave uh, a description of Huntington's disease that uh, addressed ma ma cardinal and hallmark features, including uh, its hereditary nature and uh, time of onset of the disease and its course and, uh, and the main uh, symptom of involuntary movements that we call chorea, <clears throat> and the disease that was affecting also mind and mental state and cognition, and not, not only uh, motor uh, symptoms. Um, I think uh, Dr. Thompson will uh, uh, have more to say about this uh, history. Um, what is Huntington's disease? We, the, it can be inherited uh, from either parent and it can be transmitted uh, uh, to a son or daughter and every child uh, has 50 in that family where there is a carrier have a 50-50% chance or risk uh, to inherit the abnormal gene. And this is a dominant gene. Uh, it means that and if you 
if you inherited the gene, you only need one copy to manifest symptoms in the future. Uh, so this is the dominant uh, disease, and um, the, the abnormal gene, mutated gene, is located on the fourth chromosome, and the gene uh, itself was identified in 1993 um, by uh, what is called linkage analysis. And uh, sometime after that, the genetic blood test, genetic test for Huntington's disease became available. Uh, the, uh, a person of any age can develop symptoms of Parkinson's, of Huntington's disease, I'm sorry. Uh, it can begin even in childhood, in which case it will be called um, juvenile Huntington's disease. And uh, older people in their 60s and 70s sometimes uh, may start experiencing symptoms, but most of the time, the first symptoms of uh, uh, movement disorder, Korea, begin at the age of about 35, 40 years old. And the disease progresses indolently over decades, and um, uh, invariably leading to death, uh, which uh, typically occurs due to a variety of complications, such as, for example, pneumonia, uh, because of impaired swallowing and aspiration, and other infections and fractures uh, due to falls because of impairment of balance and due to also cardiac abnormalities, including arrhythmias or congestive heart failure. Sadly, uh, many people take their own life and they commit suicide uh, um, if they know they have inherited the gene and start, or started experiencing symptoms. Uh, so it is hard for people to face the, the, uh, the future uh, after they have uh, observed to their loved ones, uh, their parents or their siblings or other relatives suffering from the disease and uh, after they observed their uh, gradual decline over decades. Um, diagnosis, uh, clinical diagnosis is based on uh, primarily motor symptoms and, and first of all, of course, uh, chorea, involuntary movements. Korea comes, originates from Greek world choreography, dance-like movements. Uh, they may affect uh, uh, different parts of the body, entire body face, and their squirming, uh, twisting uh, movements uh, that may be mild or quite severe. But uh, importantly, uh, other symptoms, non-motor symptoms, in fact, begin most of the time well before any motor symptoms emerge, uh, and, and this would be uh, different problems with thinking and cognition and memory, behavior, personality, mood. Um, for example, uh, not infrequently, uh, uh, unusual diagnosis of bipolar disorder would be given to someone who is 40, 45 years old, which is not really common uh, age of bipolar disorder onset or uh, diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, for example which is something that normally would occur since very early childhood or adolescence. This is not the condition that begins at the age of 40. And only several years later, uh, it would be apparent that uh, uh, that could be other condition when people uh, begin developing uh, involuntary movements of career or other problems such as speech impairment or balance impairment. And uh, that is at that time, uh, they will see a neurologist and their diagnostic uh, path begins. There's a blood test that can be ordered uh, to identify the mutated gene, if it is present. Um, when, when, when genetic testing became available uh, in, in the clinician's community, there was an impression that uh, thousands of people will rush to get tested those who knew that they could be at risk because of illness in their family members, and that didn't happen. Uh, many people, in fact, did not want uh, to learn whether they carry or not carry the gene. Um, but anyway, so the, these days we have uh, genetic testing that may, it's a simple blood test. We will get the result in, in several days to a couple of weeks. And if, um, the gene is abnormal. Uh, uh, one will develop uh, symptoms of Huntington's disease indefinitely. 
what is this gene? The gene is, is built of uh, repeated uh, units. Uh, we call them trinucleotide repeats, CAG repeats. And uh, after a certain number of units in the gene, uh, this gene becomes abnormal. And, and, and there is abnormal product of this gene, abnormal protein that will uh, be accumulated in the brain and disrupt uh, brain function, cell function. So if, if one has uh, greater than 40 uh, CAG repeats, it means uh, that they will develop Huntington's disease. It's abnormal gene, but there's a gray zone of 36 to 39 CAG repeats where uh, uh, it is not clear if uh, one will in fact develop symptoms uh, of Huntington's disease. It's called reduced penetrance. This is the very uh, interesting and important uh, area um, in the research, and, and maybe that's where uh, efforts uh, must be concentrated. We don't know who, uh, who and why uh, with this uh, reduced penetrance develops symptoms of the disease, why others de one uh, develops, the other doesn't, with the same uh, repeat expansion length. So it is likely that a uh, variety of uh, internal and external factors exist, including other genes and other enzymes or other uh, or biological factors inside the brain, inside the body that control the behavior of abnormal gene, making it express itself or not express itself. And uh, uh, in my opinion, this uh, 27 to 35 repeat length it's a very interesting uh, zone too. Uh, to the, the standard, the current, current teaching now is that uh, one cannot be symptomatic with this repeat length. They may transmit the gene to the next generation and, and the gene typically will become longer in the next generation and the offspring may become symptomatic. But so far uh, in the textbook you will read that you cannot be uh, symptomatic with intermediate repeat length um, I, I think at this point there's enough uh, evidence in the literature that uh, these people unfortunately may become symptomatic later in life. I, in my clinical practice I encountered uh, two 83-year-old people. They had slight career with CAG repeat lens of 29. I think that's, that, that's an interesting point here from our bridge between clinic and, and uh, a research uh, environment is, you know, we use control, we use uh, genetically modified animals to, to study the disease and uh, uh, I wonder if, if control with 28 repeats is a true control. So we don't know if uh, that repeat length could in fact carry some, uh, some pathologic uh, functions to um, Knowing a lot about the uh, gene and clinical course of the disease, there are certain observations have been made over the decades uh, that uh, longer repeat length uh, most likely will result in younger age of onset of symptoms of the disease. And probably uh, the, the larger number of repeats will make disease more severe. Uh, less clarity is with regard to the, the, the course of the disease, including both severity and speed of progression. Uh, it's not clear if repeat length, uh, in fact, is the key uh, factor here. Other um, aspects may, may affect disease course. And uh, interestingly, so far, uh, no one uh, has identify, identified uh, any correlation between the length of CAG repeat and um, cognitive behavioral mood manifestations of the disease. This is quite a um, popular way of uh, uh, demonstrating the plethora of symptoms of Huntington's disease. There are three big groups of symptoms, motor symptoms, uh, cognitive and behavioral symptoms psychiatric symptoms. And motor symptoms, these are not only chorea in multi-movements, but other problems such as balance impairment leading to falls and uh, 
uh, speech difficulties uh, leading to uh, loss of clarity of speech and significant impact on communication and um, impairment of swallowing with a risk of aspiration and the rigidity of muscles and stiffness and sometimes symptoms resembling really Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, even tremors and cognitive symptoms are uh, represented by uh, loss of memory and, and, and speed of processing and uh, um, poor judgment, uh, poor concentration, disorganization, and uh, change in behavior, apathy, depression, anxiety, and tendency for suicide. So the, you, you can see that you know, entire brain and body and mind and soul are affected uh, by this disease. I, I came across the interesting uh, you know, comparison that Huntington's disease is uh, Lou Gehrig, ALS, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease simultaneously. Even though other neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease, of course also affect uh, uh, mind uh, and body, uh, in addition to the brain, I think that's a striking in, Hunt in Huntington's disease in particular. Uh, this is uh, one of my patients, Lisa. Uh, I met her. Uh, about eight, nine years ago, and she was uh, 50 years old. She wanted to be tested for Huntington's disease because she noted some mild involuntary movements in her body. You can see some of them. This video was made at that time, about uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. There's a little wiggling movements in her fingers you can observe, and some uh, wiggling movements in her toes and her left foot, and, and minimal movements in her face. And um, uh, she noted these movements and she uh, wanted to be evaluated and she wanted to be tested for Huntington's disease. Her mother was affected by Huntington's disease. Uh, the age uh, of uh, 43 years old, so uh, at the age of 50, Lisa started developing some symptoms. However, when, when, when we went back and, and uh, evaluated her entire history, it was clear that her symptoms uh, began much earlier. For the past 10 years, she couldn't hold a, any job for uh, longer than a year or two. She had significant problems with organization and uh, memory, keeping her appointments. Um, so her symptoms began before uh, she noted uh, involuntary movements. But uh, fortunately, Lisa did uh, quite well. Uh, and so far, um, She's completely independent and um, she has some career. You see that career is more prominent here. And um, at one point we had to start medication to treat career that became uncomfortable, but not necessarily physically disturbing. And uh, over the course of eight years, there, there, there have been uh, only mild progression of symptoms. And her balance is very good. She has not had any falls. She has some slowness of thinking. She has some OCD symptoms, which are more disturbing than anything else, and we are trying to address this. And um, uh, this is David. Uh, he uh, is uh, also 59 years old now as Lisa, and he was diagnosed with uh, Huntington's disease at the same age as Lisa, at about 51. And he was brought uh, for evaluation by his wife. He was completely unaware of any problems that he had. And his involuntary movements were noted by others, and some cognitive difficulties were noted by his employers. And um, over the years, um, medications for Korea had to be initiated as Korea had been violent uh, to the point of uh, him not being able to stay on his feet. Uh, so he's on highest dose of uh, Huntington's uh, Korea medication that we have available with some Korea still present. Uh, you can see the, how this case is different from Lisa's. The, these are people of same age. They were diagnosed uh, at the same age. They started having symptoms approximately at the same age. Interestingly, they have same repeat length of 44 and uh, they have such a different disease course. And, and David here requires uh, lots of assistance from his wife with basic things such as dressing due, he, due to his clumsiness and loss of coordination. 
Um, and he, he's a very nice person, extremely nice person. Um, it is interesting that you know, some people, the disease affects dramatically uh, their demeanor and, and their personality. And some people who are such a nice and kind people throughout their entire life, they never experience any uh, deterioration in that uh, territory. Um, uh, this is Maria. Uh, Maria is 62. She had uh, disease symptoms for probably 30 years uh, uh, upon discussion with her daughter. But she was seen by neurology, actually just uh, neurologist uh, only maybe 10 years ago when um, certain behavioral problems were noted, aggression and irritability, and not so much involuntary movements, although they had been present for years. We discussed with her daughter, then when she looks back now, she understands that her mom had uh, Korea for at least 20 years uh, before she was seen by a neurologist. And Maria uh, is wheelchair bound. She, she needs help with all basic daily tasks, including feeding herself, and uh, she's also on the highest dose of our Huntington's Korea medication, which has been uh, very helpful. And she's also on uh, three medications to control her mood and behavior and aggression and different very unpleasant symptoms that are extremely disturbing to family and neighbors and, and I'm sure to the patient herself. Uh, with knowing so much about the gene, where it's located, uh, how it's built, and about the correlations between the, uh, gene length and age of onset of the disease and possibly uh, rate of progression of the disease, uh, it is still impossible to predict uh, the course. Uh, uh, patients who were diagnosed with carrying the abnormal gene, young people of 26, 27 years old, they will ask this question, when I'm going to develop my symptoms with my repeat length of 44, with my parent repeat length of 43, and uh, with their age of onset such, and, and so forth, and we cannot answer that question. As there is no really correlation between uh, what uh, uh, happened uh, to, to a parent or a sibling or other first degree relative in terms of disease course uh, and progression and what is going to happen to uh, uh, other person uh, affected by abnormal gene. And uh, that's, this is the area of uh, um, very intense research and uh, of course it would be good to have some predictors, clinical and non-clinical and, uh, and biomarkers of this disease progression and uh, rate of this progression and severity of the disease. And uh, uh, there's such an interesting feature of this disease and Korea in general. Uh, it, it affects the uh, diagnosis, it affects uh, uh, clinical care, it affects people's life. And there is a very interesting feature of unawareness of symptoms. And uh, specifically motor symptoms. Korea may be quite severe, like in, in this lady, and she's completely unaware of her problem. And uh, she was referred to me for evaluation by her pain physician who observed uh, my, my former colleague here at UCI, who, who was no longer working at UCI, and she came saying that my pain doctor wanted me to see you. I don't know why. Uh, she, she didn't know. Her husband was with her uh, during this visit and, and they spent 30 years together and when I asked him have you observed any involuntary movements and, and he said well she's always been animated and, and we couldn't even go back to five or ten years I was curious when potentially the abnormal movement um, could have begun uh, and that probably applies to every uh, person with Huntington's disease. There is a very minimal awareness of chorea, at least initially. But there may be poor awareness of other problems, including uh, cognitive changes and uh, judgment may be uh, markedly impaired affecting people's lives. And, and this uh, patient, she, she didn't want to be tested. Uh, we had a discussion whether uh, should be interested in testing for Huntington's disease gene. She didn't have family history of any abnormal movements or any strange behavioral symptoms or any mood disorders or any balance impairments in, in either parent. 
and she was quite skeptical that why why this question is even brought up for having any testing and i I never saw her again uh, and I don't know if she if she eventually got tested but this is uh, and, and, and she did carry diagnosis of a bipolar disorder that began at 46, which is unlikely to be a bipolar disorder just statistically, and that's very typical age of onset. So I, I think, I assume, she began having symptoms affecting her cognition and behavior uh, long before she had this involuntary movements, of which she still continued to be unaware. And um, this gentleman is... Um, 73 years old. We met about uh, four years ago, I think, uh, in my clinic when uh, he had uh, violent, uh, severe involuntary movements affecting entire body. And um, he's been having some involuntary movements uh, for at least 10 years, for which he, car he carried diagnosis of restless leg syndrome uh, because he kept moving all the time. He was very restless. He appeared restless and his neurologist was treating him for restless leg syndrome with medication that would stimulate dopamine receptors, unfortunately aggravating his career at one point. Uh, but, uh, and, and maybe it was a good thing to happen because he eventually, he, uh, that uh, you know, attracted attention. And, and you can see him now uh, with minimal career. There's some movements in his hand and there's a little bit rocking movements in his torso and his head. He's on maximum dose of this um, Korean medication that we have. And uh, he's doing quite well. Uh, he's uh, cognitively intact and uh, he, uh, his mood is okay. Uh, other than severe depression that he developed when, when he, I diagnosed him, but uh, we controlled it with medication initially. But then just uh, even off medication and with counseling and support of his family and our clinic, so the misdiagnosis is not uncommon in this condition. Sometimes that's because of unusual age of onset. So that people begin exhibiting symptoms not when they're supposed to by a textbook. That's not a 30, 45 year old man. So one may not even think about possibility of Huntington's disease and there may be no family history. And he didn't have any family history. His both parents lived till 90 years old and, and, and maybe uh, his father, maybe he was a little short-tempered, that, but that's it. So that uh, it is possible that uh, one of his parents had the uh, CAG repeat length in this intermediate or, or reduced penetrance uh, range, uh, but unfortunately transmitted the gene to his son. Uh, the uh, CAG repeat here is 39. So by the age of probably 60 or 65, there were some involuntary movements present. <clears throat> with this reduced penetrance gene. And uh, uh, this gentleman has two sons, and uh, they're both in their mid or early 40s, and both did not wish to be tested. And, um, and I can understand why. Uh, uh, they may or may not develop the disease for the next five or maybe 25 years, and they do not wish to live with the knowledge that they will develop it in case they test with in the area that is uh, definitely abnormal. So a variety of other diagnoses uh, that people with Huntington's disease may, may have, such as just general fidget, fidgetiness or restlessness due to medication side effects. In fact, they, if they're treated for what is believed to be bipolar disorder with neuroleptics, they will develop involuntary movements, and then one will interpret them as tardive of dyskinesia, which is a side effect of those medications, and it will even complicate more the final, you know, arriving at this correct diagnosis of Huntington's disease. And this is uh, Harvey's gait. Uh, it looks like Parkinsonian gait. There's some dragging and shuffling a little, uh, but I think this is more likely a side effect of medication of for career that he's taking rather than progression of his disease to Parkinsonian features, but I'm not entirely sure. And um, sadly, we do not have any means yet uh, to change the disease course, and modify the disease course in any way, or delay the 
age or time of symptom onset uh, or slow down the symptom progression or choose what symptoms will be there <clears throat> in one or five or ten years. But uh, we have some medications to help the symptoms, of course medications for Korea and uh, uh, a broad range of medications that can help mood and behavior, not so much cognition. Interestingly, uh, medications that we have available for people with uh, Alzheimer's disease type impairment or Parkinson's disease cognitive impairment, uh, in my uh, experience, they do not really help cognitive problems uh, in people with Huntington's disease. And of course, we, we use uh, counseling and psychotherapy. In fact, it may be more helpful than any medication, uh, not infrequently, particularly for personality issues and behavioral issues. And of course, uh, rehabilitation therapists to help with uh, basic daily tasks and uh, right exercise program and nutrition and uh, speech and swallowing. And, and uh, this is a long list of treatments in development and clinical trials that are ongoing presently. And uh, some of these clinical trials are focusing on disease modifying aspect of uh, treatment of the disease, but some of them are just uh, uh, investigational agents for symptoms of Huntington's disease. Uh, unfortunately, uh, promising uh, uh, clinical trials. Uh, there have been failures. Uh, Dr. Thompson will address one of one of, one of this uh, big uh, territory of uh, anti-nucleotide uh, approach. If we could silence that gene, if we could cut off that excessive repeat, if we could make something not for these repeats not to express themselves, that would be a solution. But so far. Uh, there have been failures, uh, although every failure, in my opinion, in, in, in this field is, uh, this is still the knowledge that we get. This is not the failure, uh, but we, we got additional information uh, to further the development of the field. And uh, I'll finish here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, <coughs> Thanks so much, Anna, That's, that was great. Um, so I'm going to now transition over to some of the research aspects of um, Huntington's disease and touch on a teeny bit about precision health. This is uh, Woody Guthrie who suffered from Huntington's disease and he was really classic at the time from standpoint of, as, as um, Dr. Monkova was describing, of sort of misdiagnosis or not understanding the disease and was, uh, wandering aimlessly and arrested and put in a mental institution, but ended up having Huntington's disease. And his, uh, his wife actually started one of the earliest foundations, Huntington's Disease Society of America, which several people here have been funded by <laughs> to do uh, research and, and carry out research and patient support and all sorts of things. We have an HDSA Center of Excellence here at UCI actually that Dr. Morinkova runs and um, sort of all comprehensive care for individuals with Huntington's. And so Huntington's disease, as, as you heard, is caused by a CAG repeat expansion. So that's this little repeating unit here, CAG, 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 and it's a perfect repeating unit of, at the DNA level that then encodes a protein that has what we call polyglutamine stretch. So this is an expansion of a region of DNA that translates into an expansion in the region of the protein. And this protein is really important in our brain. It's really important in our whole body, but it's very important in our brain. When that mutation happens, you get a combination of new functions that shouldn't be happening and loss of normal functions that should be happening in, in the brain. And so that leads to this degeneration of cells that we just talked about and the fact that this is a dominant disease. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you've heard a, a lot about the onset, age of onset, et cetera. And, um, oh. and this, was, uh, this gene was discovered in 1993 after a 10-year search. And to just give a little sort of relevance to that, in 1983, the first marker for Huntington's disease was found on the chromosome 4. It took 10 years from that point to find the disease gene through 
the efforts of a large collaborative consortium, which I was lucky enough to be part of, now you would basically find a marker and maybe the next day you'd have that gene from the, the types of technologies that we have in hand today. But at the time, it took 10 years to get to that point. And we thought, this is fantastic. We're gonna know the next day, like first let's sequence it. Nope, no homology to anything. It wasn't the same as any protein that was known. Um, it, we had no known function. There was a lot of research to do over the years. So it's, it's been a really tough um, protein to understand, a tough mutation to understand. It seems to affect absolutely every cell type. Everything that you look at in a cell, it disrupts. It messes up in, in brain cells. And it's, uh, there is this juvenile onset form of disease, which is really, really tragic. This is a family that we're all very close to, Frances Saldana and her three children shown here. Um, this is Michael, Margie, and Marie. And along the lines of what Dr. Monkova mentioned also, all three of them, so they all had a larger repeat length in the 60s, but they all manifested very different symptoms. Michael mostly had psychiatric symptoms and he was a big guy and would get very angry and, and it, would, it was very difficult for Francis. Um, Margie had very characteristic chorea. Marie looked, had more like Parkinson's symptoms. So they all three in the same family, siblings, similar repeat lengths, had very, very different sy symptoms. And now um, Margie's children, she has two children are now 50% at risk for this disease. So there's a real urgency in what, what we're doing. And also, as you mentioned, as um, Dr. Monkova mentioned, we know that there's a real diversity in the age of onset. And this is where this whole concept of precision health comes in as well. In that um, an individual with say 40 repeats might get classically around the age of 50, with 60 repeats might get it around 30, 25. Um, and so on, and somebody with 120 repeats might get it at two, age two, which we had a, a child with that. But then there's this big range where, um, shown here, let's see if I can get my mouse to work, where you might have 40 repeats and have a huge um, distribution in the ages of onset. And those seem to be um, facilitated what, what we call modifier genes. So there's a huge area of research trying to understand what are the genes that modify this age of onset when somebody's going to get the disease. Lots of biomarkers being developed at this time, fMRIs, um, ways to, to understand what the, the symptoms are that precede onset of disease and whether we can target these. So there's all sorts of therapeutic um, uh, approaches companies started that are looking at these modifier genes as, tar as therapeutic targets. And um, we have, one of the things that we've been working on seems to be a, a modifier of Huntington's disease onset. And so we, the Institute for Precision Health here at UCI is, is leveraging this type of information and using big data approaches to understand how individuals will manifest disease when, what are the components that might go into an individual's um, disorder. So one size does not fit all when, it, when we're talking about these diseases. And so Alzheimer's in one individual is not the same necessarily as Alzheimer's in another individual or honey, even Huntington's disease. Even with one mutation, there's this huge variability that occurs and we're trying to understand that so we can treat each patient in the most effective way possible. So using all sorts of information at hand and building um, networks and trying to understand this at the, at the individual level. And so at UCI, just to mention this very briefly, we have an institute that's being developed that's been launched and there's a number of components that, that go into this. Um, there's from computational approaches, artificial intelligence, to using genomics, to using um, imaging, to understanding, uh, you know, training individuals and all across a large platform to house all this data, this huge amount of data that we have um, to, to study the disease. And in a way that's very equitable to a really ad addressing diversity and inclusion and trying to understand to use these tools to get at populations that, that might not otherwise get the care, be, have their disease understood. Uh, and so this is a real emphasis here at UCI.
So as um, Dr. Morinkova mentioned also, Huntington lowering, so this is a, to reduce the level of the Huntington gene. But, um, and, and there's a number of different ways to do this. One way is what's called this antisense oligonucleotide where basically you have the gene that encodes the protein. It goes through this intermediate step of an mRNA or a message that's transcribed. And you, they, the idea is to stop the production of the mutant protein. That um, looked incredibly promising for a very long time. It went all the way to phase three trials, a number of other companies that have started other ways of approaching this, and it just um, was stopped for, for failure to, not only did it not, was it not efficacious, but it actually was harmful to some of the individuals. And so this, the, and one of the reasons we think is that it, that A, it, it um, the individuals who were most affected by the treatment were later stage disorder in the disease, older individuals, the closer they were to onset, the younger they were, the better they did on the treatment. And this, this particular Huntington lowering affects both the normal Huntington protein that I said is really important and the mutant. So there's a no number of new strategies out there to really just get at the, the mutant form of, of the gene and that may be a more effective way to go. But what it says is we still need, we need things, all sorts of approaches to get at therapeutics. Because this was really thought to be maybe even a cure. And it, it ended up being a really sad thing for the, for the families when this didn't work. And so I'm going to just talk about two short vignettes that involve stem cells because I think they're just fantastic. And it's revolutionized what we can do in the lab, what we can do it for treatments, and one of these is going to be from the stand, this sort of precision medicine standpoint where we're using all sorts of different approaches, models, understanding the human disease, and so we developed a target that we're pursuing. The other method is that we're using stem cells themselves as the therapy. And so this is, I'm not going to get into, um, this sounds more complicated than it is, protein inhibitor of activated STAT, but this is a protein that um, so the Huntington protein can have these little tags, other ta protein tags tagged onto it called SUMO. And this PIUS-1 is the enzyme that will help attach those SUMO groups onto pro Huntington and all sorts of other cellular proteins. In Huntington's disease, so this is from a patient brain, a, a, a post-mortem uh, brain tissue from an HD individual and an individual that does not, did not die of Huntington's disease, and if you can see this little smear here, this is what's called a Western blot, but it just represents that there's protein that starts glomming together and aggregating and gets stuck together in the brain. And you don't see that in unaffected individuals. So when we did a mouse experiment, again, as you mentioned, the model mice, we put in Huntington transgene, so the mutant Huntington protein is expressed in this mouse, inject, um, uh, in this case, a virus that, that, that will reduce the level of this PIUS-1. So this enzyme that, attacks pi, that attaches pi, sumo moieties or sumo proteins onto proteins, other proteins, reduce that in the brain of a mouse, um, an HD mouse, and you see rescue of the, the connectivity between the neurons, the, their activity, their communication between neurons, so the synaptic deficits. You see that their motor abilities improve. They, they take on um, motor deficits that are reminiscent of Huntington's disease, and that's improved. You, when I mentioned this little smear, which you can see here, this is when you reduce the level of that protein, and you see a drastic reduction of that aggregated, clumped up protein, which we think is um, quite toxic. So then we went on to use omics, to, to really use a variety of tools that we could understand at a very deep level what might be happening in the disease and also in the presence of this um, reduction of this protein. And when we think of omics, um, I looked it up in Wikipedia and it basically said like the group of changes that represent om genomics or omics. It, it was very undescriptive. But we're just taking a snapshot of what happens in the cell at all the different levels. So when we look at the DNA, we can look at how the DNA is modified or its structure. We can look at mutations in the DNA that might um, confer changes. So this is where 
mutations in everybody's, not mutations, but the, we have variation in all of our DNA. And that variation can contribute to the variation in disease presentation. So we're trying to understand that at the level of genomics. At the level of transcriptomics, which is these messages that get transcribed, that, that then is converted into proteins. And you look at those proteins, and those, that's proteomics. You can look at all sorts of other molecules in the cell as well, and use that information to understand the disease. And what we've been able to do more recently then, since the advent of induced pluripotent stem cells, is to use patient cells that we convert into these iPS cells so we can study the disease in individual patients and their cells. And so this is just an example of what an iPS cell is, where you start with, the, this is what would normally happen during development. You have cell types that, that become skin cells or, what, or other cell types. Then you can take one of these adult cells, reprogram it back to that embryonic state, and then you can drive it into any cell type that you want to study. And so in our case, we're very interested in studying brain cells. But you can do things like you know, create beating heart cells in a dish. So we can really start to study human disease in a way that we've never been able to before. So um, just one example that I think is, is very cool is um, uh, Charlie Smith Geeter in the lab had developed a, a way to grow these brain cells, these, these neurons that are affected in the disease, the medium spiny neurons, on these grids that were then put into a microscope to really study what the cells look like inside of them at a very deep level. So you, they, they were grown on these, what are called electron micrographs, grids. And then um, this huge microscope is shown here. This is a cryo-electron tomography microscope up at, um, up at Stanford and uh, in collaboration with Wa Chu. You can look very deeply into the structures that in the cells. And in these HD cells, you can see these little black dots. Those shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be as enlarged as that. So these are very aberrant structures that are found in the mitochondria or the energy producing part of the cell. And when we um, reduce the level of this pious protein that I was talking about, that just doesn't happen. So we're starting to get at things that are very early in the disease process that are abnormal and that we can correct through understanding the, these targets, these potential therapeutics for Huntington's disease. And so we now have done years and years and years of study on this particular protein, and it, it has incredible benefit um, in mice. It has incredible benefit in iPS neurons, um, so that the induced pluripotent cells that become neurons rescues uh, the aberrant structures, rescues transcription. And what just came out this year, which was very satisfying, is that in humans, so in people with Huntington's disease, they found that there's an actual variant that confers later onset of HD. So basically, the equivalent of knocking down Pius I that we've been doing experimentally, if you have a DNA change in your gene for that, it can confer a, a later age of onset. And it, it has the equivalent um, effect of reducing the activity of that protein. So it really seems to be going in the right direction. Um, and uh, we're developing um, drugs and, and um, ways to knock down in, in people. So we're working hard on that. So the other piece that we're, uh, that's going on in the lab is to use the stem cells themselves as a tr therapy. And the idea is that there's different goals for stem cell transplantation. This is being used for Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury, and a number of other disorders, is to either provide, bathe the cells that exist with support to make them as healthy as possible, or replace the cells that are lost, or some combination of the two. And this is a huge endeavor um, that's been funded by CIRM for many, many years. And, um, Dr. Marankova is involved in this. We're going to, hoping to do the trials here in the stem cells in, through the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic. And a number of investigators and, and um, consultants and people in the field. And this is really led by Jack Reedling here at UCI. And one of the things that we found from our work 
you know, collaborating across trying to find the gene, all the other um, endeavors that have been going on over the years is the power of collaboration. And so we've started a, an organization called Stem Cells 4HD that is multinational, many, many different sites, many investigators working together. We had the first meeting here at UCI in 2018 to try to, to address the challenges that are inherent with a stem cell treatment for Huntington's disease and many others, but you know, how, what the surgical device is that you implant the cells with, like what kind of immunosuppression you're putting in cells from somebody else that into an individual and you might have rejection, understanding the readouts that you would need, all sorts of different things that are, that are challenges in this area. And um, just a couple more slides, I know we're getting short on time. Um, so we are using what's called an, an NSC or a neural, um, this is a neural stem cell. And this, so I mentioned these are the embryonic stem cells that can be converted to any kind of cell. We're using one that goes on to become different types of brain cells. And there's a whole uh, manufacturing scheme that's been developed uh, to produce this NSC that, that has the characteristics that we have found to be protective in Huntington's disease. So we've done a number of trials in HD mice um, and repeated them over and over again where we, we implant these cells into that region of the brain that degenerates. So this is just into a mouse model. We've done both short-term models and long-term models. And um, so inject them, let them go for a month here in this case, do all sorts of behavioral tests, including this little running wheel that you see here that they like to trickle on and HD mice will fall off. We found that the treatment um, is very protective against some of these uh, movement disorders, against uh, um, multiple outcomes, memory, cognition, and again, we're reducing that smear of protein, that aggregated protein in the brain. Um, they, they produce a trophic factor, a protective factor in the brain called BDNF, and that's just shown these little red dots here are produced by those NSCs. This is when you don't have any of the NSCs there. And there seems to be a correlation with how much of that's produced by the NSCs and how well the mice do. And we had one mouse in particular at very high levels and we called Mighty Mouse. Um, it did really, really well. Um, did a long-term study where we did tests such as this running wheel. They like to go on this running wheel. There's a learning component to that and the, and the movement component to that. And there was profound rescue. So on this graph shown here, an HD mouse on the bottom that really can't do this task, a normal mouse up here that does really well on this running wheel, and these are the treated mice. So they look much closer to the unaffected mice. This is an example. Um, they become neurons, so they start, they keep going along that lineage. They keep developing further and further and further into neuronal types. So they start to become neurons in the brain, which we were not necessarily ex expecting. You can see these dots here are just staining with markers of um, different types of neurons in the brain. And so they're, they're going along this developmental path to become neurons. And even, they, some of them even become these cells, and this is just showing, you can see these, these little yellow dots. They start to become the cells that are lost in the disease, these medium spiny neurons. Just a small portion of them, but just, again, not expected. And finally, um, this is another type of electron microscopy, another way of looking at the cell. And all I'm gonna show here is this is a human cell here, transplanted cell making a contact with the mouse cell, shown here along there, they're talking to each other, or human cells talking to each other, um, which su suggests that you might be getting some new circuitry and new connections between the cells and contacts between the cells. And this is, looks very complicated, and all I want you to look at on this thing, this is that we've gone in and taking those cells out to understand what happens to the mice when we transplant those cells in there. So we're looking at mouse cells, so the, the brain of the HD brain, and the only thing that to look at is this green color, which is the untreated treated cells or the untreated mice, they have a certain pattern. That pattern shifts over here. You can see the pink cells. 
and that looks much, much more similar to a wild type mouse. So even at the level of what genes are expressed, you're shifting from this HD pattern to a more wild type pattern. So that was also very encouraging. So right now we're in the process of um, doing the IND enabling activities for phase one clinical trial. So this is an investigational new drug. We've carried out all the safety and tumor genicity studies. They're done. Everything's very safe. There's no tumors. There's no, there's no problems at all with these mice. Um, we've even uh, done some testing in a couple of non-human primates to, to look for delivery and placement. And we're getting very close to filing the, the IND with the FDA and hoping that they'll approve this. And so we hope to have a clinical trial starting um, sometime in early 2000 or in 2023. So just a thank you to all the funding support that's funded all this work. It's been pretty amazing. And the lab, who many of them are here, and we really appreciate everything they do. So thank you. OK, so um, you have a number of questions online and um, a fair number of people that are there online. Let me give the first shot for anyone who's in the audience here tonight, not you guys, <laughs> who they know. might have a question for, for Leslie or Anna. Any takers? No, we can go to online questions. I have a question for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of kind of general discussion, it was such a great lecture and a great explanation of the clinical manifestation and, and what the underlying basis for the disease is. It kind of begs the question for maybe people who are out in the audience, although they didn't see this one, these, the CAG repeats, the polyglutamine repeats. Is this the only disease that there is? No, Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's actually a number of disorders that are caused by this exact same mutation. And a number of them are ataxias, where they have problems walking and moving. Um, actually, you could talk about this better than I could. But there's a number of them. But they're all in different, pro different genes. And they affect different parts of the brain and have different symptoms. So they all have the same mutation, but it's the context that that mutation is in dictates what that disease is going to look like. So it's, yeah. So, because I, I find that really interesting. I know, it's amazing, it's, actually. And so are there, are, is that kind of repeat actually a pretty common error? And just in some cases, it produces disease? Or like, if, you know. The repeat's there all the time, right? So under But in some 20, genes, it causes disease, and in some genes, not. No, I can't mm -hmm. think of a single example if you expand it past a certain range you don't get something, so there's a disease. more of these out there. Yeah, and even if you, there's an experiment, just very quickly, that where they put a CAG repeat expansion into a completely, HPRT, completely different gene causes a neurodegenerative disease in, in an animal. Yeah, so that kind of leads to Rick Robertson's question, who's online, so I'll ask that one for you, Rick, um, which is, okay, cool, or not, that you get neurodegenerative <laughs> disease with these expansions. But you mentioned this is a really important protein everywhere, right? Yes. So why does this show up as neurodegenerative disease as opposed to cardiac? What, you know, what are the effects in the rest of the body? So that is one of the million dollar questions, but um, there are a number of things we think to be the case. One is that brain cells are what are called post-nitotic. They don't continue to divide. So they're stuck with those cells are stuck with this stuff in there as it's accumulating and it's glomming up the, the machinery in the cell and it's not doing what it's supposed to. They don't have an out in a way. They mm -hmm. can't keep dividing and, and turn over, which you, you do have in many in blood cells and skin cells and other cells in the body. But what I will say is if you do take skin biopsies, you do see changes in those cells. There are heart, heart problems that we're finding out. There are muscle problems we're finding out. There, in some of the mouse models, you see diabetes, problems with the pancreas. There may be problems in the liver. So there, there's more than just the brain. It just, but it does seem to be very selective for those cells that don't turn over. I don't know if you want to comment more Anna, on that. We, we know a lot about uh, non-brain manifestations of other right. neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, such as Parkinson's disease. Gut. Like, you know. 
yeah. sure. gut and, and, and skin uh, and sebaceous glands and bladder and uh, uh, everything. Uh, and we don't really have a lot of information about uh, outside of the brain impact of Huntington's disease, which although every single cell has inherited abnormal gene, uh, uh, and yes, maybe maybe regeneration of cells in other uh, areas helps. Uh, I was just thinking about the other thing that you know, in in experiment we have the lifespan is uh, drastically different. The mouse, yeah, uh, and we have some time to study the genetic model, and we have 40 years in a person for them to become yeah. symptomatic. Yeah. So it takes decades for the gene to uh, make a damage. And there seems to be a, you know, aging is a component of all this, and CAGB repeat is a component of all this. And so they start, the longer the repeat, the younger you can be before yeah. you shift over a threshold. So you guys are practically scripted tonight. That was great, <laughs> which leads into the next online question, and then I'll go straight to you, okay? Um, which was, um, if, so, can you take cells from a Huntington's patient, maybe reprogram them, right, to be pluripotent, redifferentiate them in your great video to be neurons? And is that, can that be used to predict course of disease or <coughs> potentially, you know, drug screening for individual treatments, right? Yes. So that would get into the area of precision health. <laughs> yes, it would. But, um, yeah, so somewhat. So the. It, you know, when you reprogram these back, as you know, they, they become, they wipe clean of some of their memory of being, having been a sick cell or, or carrying some of the features from an individual with the disease. But you can start to, especially start looking at these, the effects of these modifiers in the cells, you can start understanding the, the cell. You can't, we haven't yet been able to really pre use it for predictive value but you can certainly use it for screens. Absolutely can use it for screens. So there's whatever process you think is very important, you can screen drugs and other things against that. Yeah, perfect. When you were talking about the, MR, when you were talking about the mRNA, I forget which one of you, um, were you is that like a gene editing? Because I hear about gene editing and I forgot. It's CRISPR. Yes. Yeah. So is that something that would be useful? Or? Very useful. So okay. there, there's, I don't know if you want to come. Yeah, so, so CRISPR is, it's a way of editing the, the DNA in a cell. And so um, you can, that cell line that I showed you where the HD cell line had these aberrant granules in the mitochondria, then we, we CRISPRed a mutation into that gene so that it didn't produce that protein anymore. And that was the cell line that, from the same individual, that no longer produced those structures. Um, there is a big approach to use CRISPR to treat the disease, because if you could go into the brain and basically knock that out in some way through CRISPR engineering, but there's all sorts of delivery problems, off-target problems, you know, you don't want to do the wrong gene. Um, but it is an area of active research. I don't know if you wanted to come in. <laughs> well, the, the biggest problem, I think, is that uh, we don't want to knock out the good portion of the gene. So we need the gene. We need the Huntington protein. Uh, it has a function. So we, we only should uh, do this precise cutting yeah. off the little tail of that expanded gene without doing anything to the, uh, the rest of the gene itself um, the and also to the other copy that we have. So right. the, this creates lots of difficulties in uh, any aspect of, the, of this big field. Uh, uh, it's just another approach. I mean, all of these, we're trying to develop all these things. They all have their own Exactly, their own individual application and their own individual challenges, right? That we're trying to all overcome. Yeah, but that's absolutely. Takers in the audience, no? Learn once. No. Um, so, uh, one last question, maybe from online, and then yeah. I'll like yeah. maybe ask a wrap-up question to have you guys close. And that is, which you both touched on a little bit. 
But understanding the emphasis that um, cells of the really long-lived postmitotic cells, like neurons, mm -hmm. and, you know, cells of the central nervous system, maybe have some particular vulnerabilities here, even though it's a global disease yeah. in its own way. Um, are within those neuronal populations, within different brain regions, are they all equally susceptible? Or is that different? You kind of touched on yeah. this, but not quite. Yeah, I didn't get into that very much. But yes, there is selective vulnerability. So the, as Dr. Marinkova showed, the caudate, like the region of the brain that shows degeneration, those cells are selectively vulnerable, what are called medium spiny neurons, to the presence of mutant Huntington. They tend to die off. Now the cortex, another brain area, also has vulnerability to Huntington, but in a different way, and they don't seem to die off as to the same degree. They, the brain shrinks and things like that. But they, so they, they, it affects multiple brain types, but in very different ways. And the medium, the striatum is particularly sensitive to the presence of this mutation. And if you want to say anything, I'm sorry. <laughs> she covered it. Okay. <laughs> So then, because um, I know we're a little bit yeah. um, late, so um, just to, to give a little bit of a, a global wrap up here then, um, I thought your perspective on how much technology has changed and therefore the pace of discovery of change was really great, right? The idea that you have a massive consortium that spent 10 years looking for the Huntington's gene, and then we could just like go get that, back, yeah. right? It's a totally different game. And that's what happens in science. It's how we go back and forth and revisit questions. So understanding that, right, and the advent you know, of stem cells, even though it's taken a, a long time for you personally to go down that path, and, and Anna, where you've seen the you know, development of new drugs and where things are going, where are things going, right? How do, you, how do you see, um, what we know now playing out over the next five or 10 years? Well, we have got quite effective medications uh, already for treatment of uh, hallmark uh, you know, movement disorder of Huntington's disease. That's very effective. Um, we have two medications of, of this class. And Maybe we'll have more effective medications in the future because we're targeting the certain mechanism by, by which this involved in movement begins. And uh, the, the medication that we had uh, 10 years ago was very effective, but it was unfortunately poorly tolerated. And certain modifications have been made so that it is now tolerated much better. And their stadia concentrations are achieved without ups and downs and allowing using actual lower doses. So this, uh, that's very exciting that we can, I, I showed some videos of patients who are almost uh, Korea free on these medications with uh, zero side effects. Uh, that's pretty remarkable result in, in, in this devastating condition that we don't have many tools uh, so far. Uh, but uh, we are hopeful to have uh, something that will slow down uh, onset of the symptoms or postpone the uh, beginning of the symptoms. And it looks like we have the the targets there that uh, in animal model uh, definitely demonstrated a delay of onset of symptoms. The, the anxiety provoking things and the concerning thing is that and for human brain is not an animal brain and, and there have been multiple clinical trials and investigational agents failed in other conditions, in Parkinson's disease for example, that, that seem to be perfect and very extremely effective in animal. And for different reasons, and delivery itself, and maybe we intervene too late uh, with these interventions when the disease is uh, already too widespread throughout the, throughout the entire brain. Um, hopefully we can just target this uh, medium spiny neurons uh, early. Uh, Dr. Thompson and, and her efforts, uh, we are hopeful that this will be a, a solution to that problem. Yeah, I think just to echo what you're saying, Anna, it's just the knowledge that has been gained over the years that that we understand so much more about the disease. The first trials were just, let's try this, you know, just out of nowhere and because it might help mitochondria. But now we have we have targets that are developing. We're learning from these clinical trials that have not advanced, but we're learning a lot about it, about it. So I have quite a bit of hope that I mean, we just had a conference in August that a lot of these people were at, and 
I mean, wouldn't you say it's an amazing number of potential ways to treat this disease that are emerging? It's just stunning that, that what the advances that are being made. I mean, you know, at, at this, with stem cells and the advantage that we have human stem cells that, are, that we, can, we can test these therapeutics in. And one of the reasons I showed that, those little bubbles where it shifted like that, is because what, I think one of the reasons that the animal models may not have provided as much benefit or information is that we were looking at, you know, how they were moving and things like that, but getting down into the real molecular characteristics might help also. So we'll see, but I'm very optimistic. So that was really great. Um, I just maybe want to add one comment since we veered on to stem cells and clinical trials in, in our closer, and that is just that um, for those who might be watching this in the, in the audience, a stem cell is not a stem cell is not a stem cell. You can't plug Leslie's work into um, some of the uh, direct-to-consumer marketing for yes. stem cells that is out there now. So I would just reiterate that caution in terms of closing. Um, we have two people in the audience tonight who have spoken about that at this series. Brian Cummings has a lecture, um, uh, Hope Versus Hype, um, that is up on our website and our YouTube channel, and, and Lee Turner, who um, spoke at the beginning of this year. Um, on that topic here. So um, stem cells are fantastic. God knows I certainly believe that. <laughs> very good but point. Um, the process that goes into going to an FDA authorized clinical trial is, is unique and it's critical. And doing those sorts of trials through something like the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network is something that's really important. Yeah. So with that, I'll just close and say thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks if you came in person and thanks very much for joining us online. Thanks.